Hello, this section is about natural selection. We have seen that in the last class also we have uh, covered this topic uh, again and again. The natural selection simply means that some variants survive to reproduce, you know, so they reach the reproductive age and then they mate and uh, pass on their, uh, the, you know, the, the sequences, right, their genes to the next generation. That exactly is what is captured in uh, the term natural selection. And of course, natural selection has been conceived independently. Of course, Darwin is now credited, but Charles Darwin and uh, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, both are, uh, you know, now credited for discovery of the natural selection. Although we tend to attribute more uh, credits to the Darwin because he amassed a lot of proof for it. Uh, at the same time, the Alfred Russell Wallace, while he was on, a, uh, on his field trip, you know, he was a biogeographer, right? He was in uh, Indonesia that time when he got a fever. <laughs> you can read about it. Uh, very interesting, uh, you know. So if you if you read the, uh, the some of, some of the books which are recommended on history of sciences, he was on a field trip on a remote island in Indonesia when he got a fever. Then he was thinking about the Malthus uh, theories and the reason for all the variants and how the evolution works. Then suddenly he got this idea about natural selection. So it was just like a thought experiment, you know. So he got a sudden revelation about the natural selection. Then he he knew that Darwin is working on a uh, theory of evolution. So he wrote a letter to Charles Darwin. So then the Darwin thought, okay, it's better to share the grid with uh, Russell Wallace. So that is how this theory evolved. So this is like the central piece of the theory of evolution, you see. So the four uh, hallmarks of the natural selection is that, by the way, natural selection is completely centered on variants. So variants are everything for the natural selection. At the same time, earlier uh, to the theory of uh, evolution is, you know, intelligent design or special theory of creativity. Uh, all the way you can root back to the, the plateaus, essentialism. So it completely invalidates uh, the, the variants. So according to the essentialism, it's the essential, ideal, uh, you know, the essence of any species, for example, a horse or a human being. There is an ideal divine essence and all the variations are departure from that ideal norm, you know, so that they, they were completely discounting the variants. But uh, the Darwin's uh, natural selection, Darwin's and Wallace, of course, is that everything is centered on the variants. So variants are the key because some variants survive to reproduce better, you know. So what are the four, four hallmarks of the natural selection? Number one, there is variation. Variations are really, really important. Second, some variants are, variations are heritable. Not all variations are heritable, you see. Only some of the vari variations are heritable. For example, if you ha ever happen to have a, a disease in your lifetime so you know whatever usually whatever happens to your body during your lifetime are not heritable right but if you're born with certain abnormalities uh, certain uh, you know alleles then chances are high that this kind of heritable variants are you will be passing on to your offsprings too and uh, for example your eye color or the hair color or even skin color or even intelligence, all these are heritable. We have plenty of proof that IQ is heritable, you know. So, yeah, so some variations are heritable and some variants are more fit, you know. So, this natural selection deals only with those heritable variants, not non-heritable variants. That means uh, differences in morphology which are not attributed to the genes. Natural selection doesn't deal with that deals only with heritable variations and some of those heritable variations make the organism more fit fit means adaptive to the environment you know so that exactly is what the, the natural selection is all about number four fit variants increase in frequency in the population because they survive to reproduce better you know so that is called differential reproductive success so so uh, you know so the organisms are keep on competing amongst each other in one species in one population you see 
so we are competing with others for mate and to uh, utilize resources so some variants which are better adapted to the local habitat survives because only those variants reach the reproductive age you know they, they survive to reproduce that is exactly uh, the principle of natural selection in a nutshell so the variability is really the key you know so you can contrast that with the aristotelian essentialism or plato's idealism in which departure from the ideal form are regarded as imperfection so not here in the in the natural selection of the valis and Darwin. so what are the other attributes of the natural selection the fitness the term fitness means individual's ability to reproduce so how fit you are that means how how uh, likely you are to survive to the reproductive age and to find a mate and pass on your genes to the next generation that is exactly what the fitness is all about you know so the biological fit concept of the fitness refers to reproductive success it's it's not really uh, you know the physical fitness and also it's nothing to do with the survival even if you survive till uh, you know to, uh, till an advanced age you know if you haven't made any mate if you haven't made any offspring if you haven't found a mate and then offspring then there is no fitness your fitness is zero you know that is the hard reality of the darwinian uh, you know gene centric uh, you know view of the evolution so it's a relative concept that's also very very important individual compared with the population you know so you uh, individual alone there is no meaning of this natural selection so you need to compare that with a bigger population so you are competing so that is the the uh, a slight difference between darwin's version of natural selection and wallace version of uh, natural selection the intricate difference here is that darwin's version is more about uh, individual competition while wallace version is more about environmental pressure you know so environment is saving uh, the variants and some environment uh, some variants are better suited to the environment at the same time darwin's version is emphasizing more on the uh, competition among the individuals of the population so that is the intricacy here so in both ways it's a relative concept you know individual in comparison with its population and natural selection deals with the extent to which the individual contributes its gene to the future generation so it is a quantifiable it's a it's a uh, you know it's a mathematical concept you know so it is you can quant quantify the natural selection and evolution is of course is a statistical and probabilistic uh, process so you can model uh, the molecular evolution by the forms of equations you know so that is what we we do that uh, for example kimura two parameter or tamura nay all these equations are used to model the probabilistic uh, you know uh, data set so that is why this uh, this the, the evolution is actually a mathematical uh, concept you see coming to the fitness so fitness as i told you it's the success of an organism in its environment so that allows the organ to spread or transmit the genes to the next generation you know the rate at which the genotype increases in the population is called fitness so if uh, the, the uh, individual is having high fitness, that means that it can transmit a large number of genes to the next generation. So low fitness means uh, transmission of the genes is very low. So there are three kinds of fitness. One is called absolute fitness. Second is called average fitness. And the third is called relative fitness. So what are the differences between these three terms? Absolute fitness means the number of offsprings an individual makes. You know, so like for example, if you have two kids, then your absolute fitness is number two. So it's also known as fecundity. Now, average fitness is the average number of offspring of a species. So the average fitness you are looking at one species in one go. You know, for example, cat or a human being, Homo sapiens. What is the average fitness? Or a whale, or a you know, or a dolphin. All these things you can call it as average fitness so average number of offspring of a species now coming to the relative fitness is the ratio of these two you know absolute fitness upon the average fitness so for example if you look at this kind of a dolphin uh, in the one individual dolphin produces four 
offspring so here the fecundity is four number of offspring is four right so absolute fitness is that number of first to number four is absolute fitness and average fitness in the dolphin species as a whole is let us say three so in that case relative fitness is absolute fitness upon the average fitness that is four by three that is 1.33 so that is how to calculate the relative fitness so to, to calculate the relative fitness you need to know uh, the average of the species as a whole and of one person's a number of offsprings you see so there are several of the uh, ideas that we learn in the school about the natural selection and uh, so many of the books we have preponderance of textbooks right some of the concepts that we learn in these books are natural selection acts at the population not the individual but the population as a whole natural selection acts at the genotype rather than the phenotype not the morphology but the genotype that is the dna or rna you know especially the gna dna molecules right and natural selection is a random process continuously random you know it is not really non-random deterministic natural selection creates new variants in a population you know new variants are created by the natural selection for example antibiotic resistant mutants or even sars cov2 uh, delta variant or alpha or beta gamma all these mutants are being created by the natural selection it it forces them to make these uh, mutants you know and natural selection results in more complexity so there is a increasing trend of complexification if you look at the biodiversity as a whole for example uh, you know first uh, organisms that ever happened luca right last universal co common ancestor had been a bacteria a prokaryote but now that it went all the way up to human being you know so we are really complicated creatures isn't it so it, it results in increased complexity natural selection is good for the species you know so natural selection leads to the survival of the species and it's always good for the species and traits can form by natural selection for example the blue eyes or you know curly hair all these new new traits can form by natural selection these are some of the ideas have been we have been learning in school and other textbooks and various youtube videos like this but friends all these are wrong you know none of these statements are real let's see one by one all these are myths about natural selection you know so natural selection is acts on the individual it's not about the population but you know the consequences are felt in the population it's actually about the individual because in nature population that the that is kind of a construct you see only the individuals are existing right and yes yeah, so it's acts acts on the individual with our uh, phenotype right so some uh, phenotype phenotypical features are good for survival for example beak of the uh, the finch uh, in galapagos which we have seen right uh, long slender versus stout and short thick right do you want long beak or a thick short beak so it all depends right uh, uh, depends on the resource availability some individuals survive so it has nothing to do with the, the DNA, but it's actually about the morphotypes. So natural selection acts on the individual's phenotype, the morphology, but evolution consists of the changes in allele frequencies. So ultimately that is how the evolution happens, but selection acts on the phenotype. So if there is a phenotypical uh, changes of certain genotype, then there, is, there won't be any natural selection happening. That is what, right? It's actually happening on the phenotype. So selection selects only heritable variations. This I have already highlighted. Only some variants are heritable, some are not heritable. Natural selection has nothing to do with non-heritable variants, you know, or, uh, that is alleles, you see. So Darwinian fitness is not same as physical fitness so in everyday life we use a term fit okay so this gentleman is fit with a nice uh, you know muscle right so muscular like bollywood actors so the persons might not be 
fit in terms of Darwinian fitness. So Darwinian fitness has nothing to do with physical fitness. It could be a slender person like a cyclist. <laughs> Cyclists are usually are not really muscular, right? And yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter whatever, if you, even if you are a lethargic, if you have, you know, multiple offsprings, a large number of babies, then you are really fit in terms of Darwin, you know. It's only to do with fertility, you know. So how many offsprings do you have? That is the only condition for the fitness in terms of Darwinian fitness. And of course, it's not just the babies, but how many babies are healthy. You know, if you have like tens of babies, but all the babies are not healthy to reach their reproductive age, then of course, you're, you're not fit enough, you know. So, and the variation is quite random. Of course, the variation, the naturally, the mutations happens on a stretch of DNA molecule, no control. Of course, there are site-directed mutagenesis by, uh, you know, the re uh, recombinant DNA technology, but that is different, that we are doing it, right? But mutation is completely random, but survival of these mutants are not random. So, natural selection, calling it as a random process is error. It is not random. You know, natural selection is never a random process because it's a selection, you know. So, only few uh, individuals are being selected because those are the ones which survive to reproduce. They, they have certain variants that are favorable for its survival to reproduce, transmit the gene to the next generation. So, natural selection is not random and uh, evolution is non-teleological. So that is another thing. So teleology means that it's deterministic. We are, uh, you know, the natural selection or evolution is going towards a predetermined course of action. You know, towards a determined, predetermined end. That is not the case. Evolution is completely non-teleological. Uh, you can never predict where evolution will lead to. You know, it has no fixed goals and it's not forward-looking. That is another uh, one of the uh, common misconception about the evolution is that evolution keeps on complexifying. Not really. So, in several lineages, simplification is happening. You know, while it's true that uh, we are a resultant of some of the complexification, especially like human eye, you know. So, simplification do happen too. So, there is no obvious patterns with the uh, you know, this kind of natural selection. And it's not progressive, doesn't lead to perfection. Another mistake that people think that natural selection always lead to perfections. No, even human be body is not perfect. Uh, if, there, if we are completely perfect, then how can you explain the existence of cancer? You know, why aren't we evolving to evade the cancer? It's not the case, isn't it? So, evolving the population, uh, so usually the populations always lack one generation you know so uh, at least one generation behind the changes in the environment so during my lifetime i cannot actually cope up with what is happening with the uh, environment like climate change is real so only that if you happen to produce an offspring during the climate change of course we are all doing that right so then the next generation will be a little bit more adapted to the changed climate but not in our individual's lifetime, it, it's never going to happen, you see. So, and of course, if environment changes during lifetime, uh, there won't be any adaptation or natural selection will happen. So, natural selection, it's it's heritable variants alone, right? You need, the, there's a factor of the reproduction in it. If there is no reproduction, then the natural selection doesn't happen at all because of fitness is zero, right? So that's, that's what the, the factor about, uh, you know, these are some of the concepts about the natural selection. And evolution is also not climbing the ladder of complexity. That is incorrect to presume, you know, like higher groups of plants, like angiosperm, commonly we call it as higher plants. While lower plants are like algae, ferns, you know, lichens, moss, lower group, wrong. You can never call it like that, lower or higher based on complexity, uh, you know, all extant organisms are equidistant from the root of the tree of life. The concept of TOL, I've covered that earlier in uh, one of our earlier lectures. 
the whole biodiversity on planet Earth, you can portray that in a giant tree like fashion. In which the root is last universal common ancestor, the first ever cell, the first ever organism that produced because of the abiogenesis, you know, the origin of life happened around 4 billion years back. So if you look the distance, the genetic distance of each and every one of the 10 million species of eukaryotic species alone, 10 million species we have in the current day in, on, the, on our planet Earth. So each of these 10 million species are equidistant, the same distance from that you bacteria, including the current day living E. coli or any prokaryotic organism, the bacteria, you know. So each and every bacteria living today's Earth are of the same distance from the first uh, ever you bacteria existed on planet Earth. You know, so that is really important. So it is not a climbing ladder of complexity. So, uh, you know, so putting like this inanimate matter to the humans through lower plant, higher plants, jellyfish, then fish, reptile, birds, mammals, and human. Wrong. This kind of way is incorrect. So as this kind of internet memes that, you know, from a, a, a mouse to monkeys, progressively going to, um, uh, you know, uh, the stone, uh, yes, so uh, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, anthropo if you look at the anthropology, right, the stone man, and then a man working, and then finally you can say that, uh, you know, the man, connected man with the internet world, uh, it's incorrect to presume that way. So, yeah, so you cannot even say that human beings arisen from monkey, and monkeys were our ancestor chimpanzee were our ancestor no you can only say that chimpanzee current day living chimpanzee or current day living monkeys by the way monkey itself doesn't lead uh, you know it, it doesn't constitute one species chimpanzee yes pan right but monkey itself is a loose term like fish right so current day living monkeys and human beings had a common ancestor only that much you can say and uh, can you call that common ancestor as a monkey? No, you cannot, right? Because that is not exactly what we call now as monkey. And uh, you can say this kind of textbook, Diversity of Lower Plants, Editors, uh, Rajan Kumar Gupta and Mukesh Kumar, wrong. Lower Plants and Higher Plant itself is not scientific. And evolutionary theory is against such usage. You can never call certain plants as lower in taxonomic hierarchy, the evolution hierarchy, while others as complex as higher plants. Please stop using the terms, you know, so that is not really correct in terms of evolutionary theory. All these are uh, fallacious. And as uh, we, I've already told you that if you look at that uh, rooted and time calibrated tree of life, this is the origin, you know, origin of uh, uh, life. So, origin of earth, then origin of life. So, it is around 4 billion years back, first cell. So, if you look at the, the distance of this particular first U bacteria to, this is also known as Luca, right? Last universal common ancestor. With any of the existing animals or plants or microbes, distance is same, you know. So, that is why... It's incorrect to call it as a lower or higher, right? And the selection acts on the existing traits, but new traits can evolve because traits supplied by the variations, right? And the variations are supplied by the mutations and recombinations, isn't it? So mistakes uh, during the DNA replications, that is when uh, the mutants are being formed, isn't it? So mutations plus recombinations plus selection that lead to the new phenotypes, you know. So that is what. So although the selection acts on existing traits, new traits can evolve, you know. So selection can also lead to new functions of the existing traits. Even though the traits are there, the functions can change. Though the trait like feather is same, but its function can keep on changing. One good example is trichomes in butterworth. The trichomes are uh, hair-like structures on the stem and leaf, 
isn't it? So the plan butterword, the, the trichomes original functions were was herbivore deterrent. Like even today's most of the plant species, the function of the trichome, for example, chickpea, uh, it's to deter the herbivore, you know, insects and other organisms that eat on uh, these plants. You can deter it with this kind of uh, uh, hair-like appendages. And that, the function of that, the herbivore deterrent function changed into catching the insect, you know, carnivorous plants. So as the other carnivorous plant like Dionia, the Venus flytrap, uh, the leaves, original function of leaf is, of course, photosynthesis, isn't it? Then it changed to snap traps in the case of Venus flytrap and tendrils of the leaf tips to attach, isn't it? to pitfall traps in monkey cups that is nepenthes so all these are changes uh, of the characters you know uh, changes in the function uh, of the existing traits so uh, you know those, so this kind of functions can keep on changing right so these are some of the pictorial representation of it and that term is what you call it as exaptation that is uh, originally uh, you know described by charles darwin so it's also known as serial homology. So it's the same thing. Exaptation, also known as co-option, secondary adaptation or serial homology. All these terms you can interchangeably use. It is nothing but shift in the function of the trait. One example from animal world is feather. Original function of feather is to provide the warmth, like fur of the animals, you know. Uh, original function had been uh, to provide the warmth. Then it changed to display. Display means males usually, male birds to have, uh, you know, this kind of display uh, to attract the females. For example, peacock, isn't it? Peahens don't have that kind of, uh, uh, you know, plumage, right? Beautiful strike, the colorful plumage of the, the feather. So that is what the display for sexual selection that is changed. Originally it was warmth, changed to display. And further it changed to the flight. Now we know that the feather is, uh, uh, you know, birds, the, the, the main function of feather is for its wings, right? For its flight. So warmth to display to flight. So that exactly is what you call it as exaptation. And uh, from fish, if you see that lungfish, the basal lungs, uh, the lungs of the basal fish evolved to the lungs of terrestrial vertebrates isn't it so sarcopterygy isn't it the the vertebrates we got that uh, our lungs is you can trace it to the lungfish lungs but also underwent exaptation to become gas bladder you know it's a buoyancy control organ in derived fish the lungfish of the current day living you can have that uh, you know you can see that this organ for controlling the buoyancy as in uh, the case of the uh, you know the scuba divers they have their own uh, you know the cylinder but you can control the pressure to achieve the desired depth of diving so that way the gas bladder you can use it to dive and to to stay afloat isn't it very interesting and uh, uh, yes so uh, this kind of acceptation is a process that gives rise to complex organs like eyes so if you trace back the history of eye you know step by step so the the function keep on changing you know so yes yeah, so that's that's very very interesting all the complex organs you can trace to uh, the serial homology you know or the co-option so you can see that uh, functionality very interesting uh, you know the law of irreversibility is quite interesting in terms of the acceptation so here it's also known as dolo's parsimony by the way, the parsimony, the word meaning is miser, you know, frugal, economically frugal. You, If you don't want to spend a lot of money saving the resources, right? Parsimonious way of living, frugal lifestyle, right? So dolo's parsimony, the concept is that, uh, you know, the uh, this one, the for example, the old form, it changes to the new form. But if you go back in time, if you try to retrace this evolutionary history, uh, the pathway will not remain same it keep on changing you know so the same trajectory you might not be able to get it so chances are high that you will never able to uh, go through the same 
uh, pathway it will lead to if you go back to the old form it might lead to somewhere else you know it's completely a random way isn't it, it depends upon the locally pre prevailing uh, you know environmental conditions right so statistical improbability of the following the exact same evolutionary trajectory twice or indeed any particular trajectory in either direction is what you call it as dolos parsimony so it is really tough to get a complex organ like a human eye you know how it's really tough so you cannot think that okay in one one fine day uh, you know uh, uh, bacterial colony can have this kind of eye it's it's not possible isn't it uh, because it's a serial homology is the reason how we got this kind of complex organisms, uh, uh, complex organs, right? And But it's really easy to lose. You know, unfortunately, so many kids are born blind because of the genetic abnormality. So just one gene, one mutation, just one, uh, you know, point mutation is sufficient to invalidate such complex organs. You know, uh, yes, yeah, so that is what the reversal is perfectly possible but uh, it's very tough to gain the complex or the reversal means that uh, you know like for example the blind couples it's easy for them i mean chances are high that the, the baby are not blind isn't it so yes yeah, so uh, reversal the reverse back mutation if uh, you know such a complex organs have formed and to lose is very you know easy but to gain is really tough through this but reversal means if if it, the loss is by just one point mutation and that mutation can reverse it back to the original so that reversal is very simple it's, it's the same thing in everyday life for example recently we celebrated celebrated rather than observed right that nasty uh, crisis 20th anniversary of that uh, notorious incident in world trade center right so what happened in that world trade center it's just a matter of seconds the entire uh, buildings collapsed by the terrorist attack right but to construct such a building it takes time it takes money it takes effort but to destroy it you know it won't take much time right just a few seconds is enough to completely uh, you know completely destroy such complex structures so same thing so death and resurrection of the genes uh, can also happen through this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, this reversal right resurrection of the genes the death of the gene is by mutation that invalidates and then resurrection is by back mutation you know so that, uh, that is what the purifying selection right so some deleterious mutations are removed by the purifying selection so uh, yes yeah, so one example is lug hemoglobin in leguminous plants so that is a homologous gene like our hemoglobin uh, you know the, the plant the legumes have like hemoglobin the function remains same the oxygen transportation you know so how did that hemoglobin the leg hemoglobin originated you know so uh, it was previously thought that this leg hemoglobin is due to horizontal gene transfer but now we know that these are homologous genes so the ancestor when uh, the plants and animal lineages unicorns and bicorns remember so when these two lineages had the common ancestor that common last universal common ancestor mrca most recent common ancestor had a homologous gene which got separated into lag hemoglobin and uh, the the and then the hemoglobin for the animal lineage so does it mean that other plants don't have that lag hemoglobin so they might be having the proto gene you know so that gene is not functional because there is no reversal happens you know so but for the the in the case of a leguminous plant that reversal happens to make it uh, functional and that is the reason why the leg hemoglobins do exist in leguminous plants you know so yes yeah, so that way if you look at our own human body we have several of the organs that just give you the legacy of our evolutionary history you know so the, these structures are what you call it as vestigial structures so uh, these are nothing but the organs or structures that remains on the organism which have no purpose rather function 
isn't it? And are not used for its original function anymore. Some of the examples include the point in the air. Some people have got like, uh, you know, uh, like uh, uh, a tapered ending on its spinner, the ear, ear lobes. Right? So that is something called Darwin's point on the ear. Ear muscles, some of you have that muscle. I do have, I can say, I can move my uh, ear, uh, ear lobe. So I'm sure some of you have it. So yes, what is the function of it? I can move my ear like cats or dogs, but does it have any function? Does it help me to survive to reproduce better? Not really, isn't it? Tonsils, we have tonsil. If you look in your mirror, you can see the tonsil. Is there any function of it? Not really. So as wisdom teeth, right? So wisdom teeth, uh, usually it causes a problem rather than it helps in mastication, the chewing of the food, you know, items, right? So uh, right now, there is no functionality of all these things, including appendix, uh, vermiform appendix. What is the function of it? Uh, it just shows you the, the legacy of our herbivorous time, uh, you know, so like like um, uh, like a cow, you know, so the, the appendix used to be a home of, uh, you know, the, the microbiome that can uh, decrease the cellulose, you know, so we, we, we used to eat uh, leaves and uncooked. Uh, you know the, the grass and all right so now of course our dietary patterns have changed a lot so appendix have no function and if you're like me if you go to antarctica you know that most of the countries used to insist on removing the appendix altogether before going to antarctica you need to remove the appendix because appendix usually cause a lot of trouble you know so uh, if it gets in uh, infected then uh, you cannot even uh, survive in such extreme environment like in Antarctica where there is no super speciality hospitals, you see. And nipples of males, what is the function? Have you ever thought it? Males of nipples, what is the function of that nipple? Of course, that is all these are vestigial structure or coccyx, that is the tailbone, right? So tailbone is the end of the uh, backbone, so there is no function. Uh, rather, it is dangerous right if you ever happen to slip onto your bathroom and if you ever happen to fall onto that backbone it hurts really bad and it leads to slip uh, you know disc right so there is no function of it or the body hair especially male have got a lot of hair on uh, on our body so what is the function of this body hair nothing all these are vestigial structure and it's not just the human but also like a whale or you know snake if you ever seen the snake's uh, skeleton you can see hip bones what does it say why whales have got a hip bone because the whales were uh, you know uh, if you look back in time at once the whales were terrestrial organism uh, which can swim very nicely like hippopotamus and it's related uh, you know organism then it went back to the ocean uh, you know as you know the whales are mammal right so it is a secondary adaptation uh, the uh, marine lifestyle so that is why it has got hip bones so as snakes currently the snakes don't have any legs right but still it has got hip bone because it lost you know so that is what losing is easy but gaining is not dolos parsimony remember so wings of ostrich, though ostrich cannot fly, it has got wings, dysfunctional. Again, it's a vestigial structure, right? Wisdom teeth and appendix, I told you. So we have several such traits and what is it adaptive or not adaptive? So it could be, uh, uh, you know, like traits like why we yawn. As you can see that the, the, this beautiful kid is yawning. <laughs> so what, what is the purpose of we yawn? or blush or sneezing you know laughing uh, or coughing so all these you know the the, the traits uh, have got uh, it has been kindled the curiosity of philosophers for thousands of years all the way back to greece so even now we really don't have any idea but of course there are explanations so some explanations tend to be adaptive to say that these have adaptive function for example one of the common thing is uh, the yawning is that 
the yawning enables us to inhale more oxygen and it replenishes our blood no that is fallacious but that kind of uh, adaptive explanations were at one point very common among evolutionary biologists every single trait they invent some uh, you know some uh, way to uh, some kind of uh, uh, reason you know so that that is a teleological explanation actually so it has been completely criticized by stephen jay gold if you read his essays you can see that so I, this is my own article in um, science reporter i have linked up in the show notes please have a look so uh, what is well, why we yawn and all those uh, human traits what is a uh, you know, sore pain gag reflex itch reflex tickle goosebumps so whatever is the current available evidence of uh, summarized in this one right so remember that not all these are adaptive but it could be just the side effects you know so of the adaptive traits uh, that is something called spandrels you know so sp it could be spandrels you know it's not really adaptive evolutions too so what are the other nature of the natural selection so is it tautological so some people used to criticize that the fitness is tautological tautology means you know circular logic like for in as in this uh, particular figure bible uh, is the word of the god why if you if you ask because the bible tells us so it's written in the bible it's the word of god you may ask why because the bible is infallible you may ask why because leads the same thing the, the the first point the bible is the word of god so it, it goes on and on and on that is that kind of explanation is something called tautological explanation it's a circular logic it's a uh, you know it's a cognitive bias you see i mean it's a logical fallacy quite related concept right so some people criticize that natural selection is also tautological you know why survival of fittest is a common definition of natural selection by the way that term survival of fittest was uh, originally coined by philosopher herbert spencer you know of course that uh, darwin as well as wallace uh, you use that term survival of fittest but that is not really a accurate way to say how the that natural selection is you know so if you uh, define the natural selection as survival of fittest then you may ask okay survival of fittest then how about fittest how do you define fit then you are saying fittest is the one who survive back to ground zero you know survival of fittest fittest is the one who survive something just like this kind of explanation circular reasoning tautology so it's invalidated so it's a logical fallacy no the reason is that the survival of fittest itself is an oversimplified and it's misleading how about natural selection that itself is misleading natural selection many of my students used to say okay natural selection means that okay nature is the is a, a supernatural power that consciously select again that is incorrect way to say that natural selection means that nature is a god and that god is selecting no it is not the case so nature doesn't purposefully select some variants but the variants are being selected just because they have uh, the adaptive traits with them you see so the implied meaning is not tautological so natural selection's implied meaning is that best adapted heritable variations increase in the frequency so only some variants are heritable right? and only those heritable variants increase in the frequency because of the adaptation and that is exactly what you call it as natural selection right and some other nature of natural selection include that selection acts on the individuals and it, it has nothing to do with the good of the species because several traits are being selected which are not good for the species you know uh, yes so altruism do exist in the nature altruism is actually you can say that it's it's for the goodness of the species because by acting by self-sacrificing you are saving a lot of other species i mean other members of your species that is how the altruism is right self-sacrifice uh yes so that is that do exist like uh, uh, squirrels right but it's pretty uncommon in the nature altruism is not that common 
तो बाय एंड लार्ज इंडिविजुअल्स आर हाईली सेल्फिश यू नो वी वांट द द पर्पस ऑफ आवर लाइफ इज टू फाइंड द मेट एंड ट्रांसमिट द जीन टू द नेक्स्ट जनरेशन एंड हेल्प आवर किन्स किन मींस रिलेटिव्स ऑल दिस आर एज पर द डार्विन सिलेक्शन यू नो यू सी लायन मदर्स डू नर्स अदर कप्स other cups means that other uh, individuals cups they do nurse you know so such things do have in in the nature but it's not that very common so and of course uh, you know not good for species because several such traits are being selected for which are deleterious to the species you know i told you about the cancer how about depression how about postpartum depression after pregnancy depression is very common and that lead to the neglect of the offspring by uh, you know the, the mothers and that is very common in human society too and why such traits are being selected how about homosexuality is there any uh, any uh, adaptive purpose you know the function of that trait but still it do exist isn't it even in other uh, uh, you know other species that such traits do exist is there any function for the goodness of species does it uh, increase the fitness of the group no so traits cannot evolve by the selection unless uh, it increase the fitness of the genes responsible for them relative to other genes so if at all the altruism do exist in uh, a specific species that means that you know the genes responsible for that behavior is being selected you know so uh, if you do all kinds of different calculation like cost versus benefit analysis uh, benefits should outweigh the invested cost then only such traits will survive because of the natural selection that is exactly is the the point i hope you got the point individuals and genes are mostly selfish we are mostly selfish like lion pride when take over the other prides do mass infanticide so pride in the sense one population of the close knit society you know one population of the lion when this lion attacks other pride so what they do is that they completely decimate all the babies do you think it's good for the species no they just want to decimate because they don't want the competing alleles to spread they want to transmit their own alleles and after immediately after mass infanticide they will not kill the females what do they do they they mate with the uh, the females is just like human invaders in the history if you look you know the invaders here in india what did they do quite similar isn't it if you think back in time quite similar yeah so they mate with the females to transmit their uh, you know their alleles their genes to the next generation so very very selfish that is what you might think that okay i'm not really selfish i don't agree with the selfish point of the natural selection but if you do a simple thought experiment things become very well clear to you that is what a, a, a very famous a thought experiment of philip of food uh, you know he was a british uh, philosopher uh, ethicist so ethics is all about what is right and what is wrong was about the morality isn't it so the problem is not a strolly problem of 1967 so it's very simple and intuitive let us say that one trolley is just rolling down from a hill the rail railway uh, uh, you know railway compartment railroad trolley is a very heavy trolley it's just rolling down a hill and you are the one who is standing here and you can control with pull of lever so if you pull lever this side towards you the trolley will take this way and if you pull push the lever towards against you so that then the trolley will take this course you cannot stop the trolley there is no way to stop that trolley now that you know so you can see that if the trolley goes on this route uh, the the tracks five kids will die and if it goes on this track one gentleman will die so now the question becomes a lot more complex if i ask you okay what if this guy is your father and these are five kids completely strangers to you what would be your decision take your time and think about it 
what will you do will you kill the five strange kids to save your father yeah i mean you may lie that you will not but chances are high that you will do it you know and yes so that is that is exactly and what if the okay now let us say that the person is not your father he is a you know he he belongs to you know uh, uh, same nationality as yours india while five or pakistan he what will you do it's uh, to whom will you save so all these are intricate concepts so at the time of like life and death situation you tend to favor shared gene pool so that is exactly what the gene centric evolution is all about so uh, now coming to finally i would like to uh, uh, briefly introduce three types of the natural selection first type is called disruptive selection what is a disruptive selection you can see that uh, all the three forms you can see in this uh, bell diagram these are nothing but you know the, the frequency distribution uh, this red one is before while uh, you know the blue one is after so the red one as you can see it's a unimodal distribution frequency with only one mode right in the center while the blue one is bimodal so before and after so after it becomes a bimodal so disruptive selection means that before it was like the uh, you know like the neutral but after many generation so extreme values are being selected that is what this disruptive selection means uh, let us say that you know you are in a, a himalayan valley if you have ever been to himalayas uh, there are rocks you know like this kind of rocks marbles beautiful uh, this is not you know it's just a, a sedimentary you know that uh, uh, pebble so marbles are white and then granites granites are completely black so a valley is full of this kind of rocks either black or white rocks and let us say there are rabbits you know so rabbits most of the rabbits are uh, brown rabbits while some are black some are white but majority of them are brown so after many 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 generation hundreds of generation chances are high that both of these extreme either white or black will be selected their frequency will increase like this you know earlier it was brown but it would be either uh, you know after many generation the white and black frequency will increase do you know why because black rabbits can seek refuge behind the granite rock the black granite rock camouflage so as white rabbits behind marble the white you know white background and white individual camouflage so yes so that kind of selection is called disruptive selection so that means the trend is towards extreme phenotypes you know like in this case this is basically you know the muscles isn't it in in the in the ocean so diversifying selection described there is another term for disruptive selection describe the changes in the population genetics in which extreme values for a trait are favored over the intermediate value so before it was intermediate values but after many 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 generation extreme values are favored so that kind of selection is known as disruptive selection hope it's very clear to you so in this case the variance of the trait increases and the population is divided into distinct groups so well who knows after uh, you know so many generations this can uh, you know this can completely lead to speciation events extreme phenotypes you know that is actually disruptive selection can lead to speciation you see now second kind of selection is stabilizing selection so stabilizing selection as you can see that before it was like you know like uh, this you know like a uh, like a dome shaped frequency diagram and after many many generation uh, you know the the frequency became distinctly a bell shaped you know from dome shape to the bell shape so as you can see the variance have uh, you know uh, decreased isn't it so it it converts into the central value so it's one good example would be like as you can see it here 
so before it is like a, you know a short tailed lizard a medium tail lizard and long tail lizard it's kind of similar with most of them are like medium tail but after many 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 generations most of the lizards would become medium tail do you know why because short tail lizards uh, and long tail lizards both have disadvantages you know the tail is really important for balancing right so short tail lizards cannot balance well though it can run faster it cannot balance well in uh, in the ceiling for example or while climbing the trees on the other hand long tail lizards they can balance well but they cannot run faster so you just need the balance you know so it converges into the central value after many generations that is called stabilizing selection another example is human babies if the baby is too small what will happen it can easily pass on to the birth canal but it cannot survive you know of course baby very very small baby like a few less than 500 gram how possible it's highly unlikely the baby can survive right you need a intensive uh, you know uh, incu isn't it neonatal inter intensive neonatal care units and what if the baby is too big of course a baby if it can go out it can survive very nice healthy baby but it cannot get out of the birth canal so you just need the right kind of size you know so that is what uh, after many generation it will stabilize on the middle value or median value that is called stabilizing selection okay so the population mean stabilizes on a particular non-extreme trade value it's just the opposite of disruptive selection the third one is called directional selection from one extreme to another extreme like the giraffe short neck giraffe to the long neck giraffe by the way it doesn't happen in one's lifetime that is uh, the problem with uh, uh, you know we have already discussed that earlier right so uh, you know one uh, individual's lifetime this kind of uh, things doesn't happen and the Lamarckism right that was a, a faulty presumption of uh, the Lamarck but of course uh, in in subsequent generations the necks uh, can uh, you know uh, gradually increase from short neck to the long neck so that is called directional selection so extreme phenotype is favored over other phenotypes causing allele frequency to shift over time in the direction of that phenotype so that is called direction selection and then the fourth mode of uh, selection you can call it as purifying selection in which deleterious sequences are removed you know uh, the population get rid of such deleterious like deleterious in the sense that uh, you know so if it is happening uh, a very very important protein so if such mutation completely invalidates that protein then what will happen even though the the zygote is formed and the zygote soon start developing to a baby inside the womb but then if that is a, a faulty genome you see that the the baby has got very very deleterious mutation uh, that leads to a faulty protein and the protein let us say the protein is uh, you know the DNA polymerase very ubiquitous every cell should have that protein and if that protein itself is uh, you know completely invalidated because of mutation what will happen still birth baby will die so that way that mutation will not be passed on to the next generation so that kind of selection is known as purifying selection right so we learned four types of natural selection these are also called modes of natural selection i also explained what the natural selection is in this uh, brief video now we will see uh, what kind of post darwinian developments happened uh, you know in our next module